Welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Cardozo and I'm president of the Pearson Center. As many, you, um, as many of you will know, the Pearson Center is a progressive think tank that addresses the major social and economic policy issues of the day. And in that context, I'm pleased to welcome you to the 13th webinar on issues relating to COVID-19 and how it is affecting our society. The earlier webinars have addressed the economy, long-term care, the manufacturing and tourism sectors, racism and world affairs. Today, we will talk about COVID on the world stage and more specifically, Canada-China relations. I wanna take a moment to thank our two sustaining sponsors without whose help these sessions would not be possible. They are Canada's Building Trades Unions and the International Association of Firefighters. I want to add that as these webinars are free, I want to ask you to consider visiting our website to make a modest donation to this process. And you can do so by going to our website, which is www.thepearsoncenter.ca slash contribute and make a contribution towards this. Now, back to the discussion today. Our guest is Ambassador Tsung Pei Wu, who is the Ambassador of the People's Republic of China to Canada. He has been a senior official in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for most of his career, focusing on North America and, and for several years has been posted in the United Kingdom and Canada before becoming ambassador to Canada in 2019. He will be in conversation with Professor Jonathan Kaloff, who is a member of the Pearson Centre Advisory Board, Professor of International Business and Strategy, at the Telfer School of Management at the University of Ottawa. He's a Competitive Intelligence Fellow and Honorary Professor at the universities in South Africa, Russia, New Brunswick, and notably China. With regard to the format, the discussion will last about 30 minutes, and then we will hear, we'll have time for a Q&A period with you, the audience. So please use the question box on your screen to send in questions ahead of time, um, and we will do, we will get to as many questions as we can in those last 15 minutes. The session is being recorded and will be uploaded on the Pearson YouTube channel later this afternoon. Our past webinars, and this will be available at uh, our, our YouTube channel, which you can get at YouTube and then ask, then uh, search for uh, Pearson Center. So I'll be back to moderate the Q&A session. And with that, over to you, Jonathan Kayla. Thank you, Andrew, for that, that wonderful introduction and the great work you're doing uh, with Pearson. Ambassador Sue, it's so great to see you again. Hard to believe it's been five months since we were together at the uh, Pearson Parliament 2020 conference, sitting together talking about COVID and Canada relations. Uh, I very much enjoyed that. It was very informative and I'm therefore very much looking forward to our discussion today. Overall philosophy, just so that you will understand and also the people you know listening in is that Pearson respects the sovereignty of, of China and any other country to formulate and execute on their international agenda. Our discussion today really is to help Canadians understand how it's set, to understand what it means, how we move forward with China. We'll talk about the relations. Uh, the chi focus really is understanding both the international relations side and the international trade strategy side as we push forward. And I thought a natural starting point, and again, I very much enjoyed it in, in February, was when you shared with us some of the lessons learned from China in terms of you know, dealing with COVID. Uh, you shared advice to Canada, which right, we really appreciated. Now that five months has gone by, can you provide an update in terms of lessons learned and uh, what really could or should be done differently? So thank you so much, uh, Professor Kalov, uh, for that. I'm so happy to see you once again, although this time we have to uh, talk of the uh, video conference, but still it's so great to take the opportunity to be at this webinar organized by the Pearson Center. So I'd also want to extend my thanks to uh, Mr. Cardozo and the Center you know, for hosting the event. So as I uh, recall, last time we actually uh, did a lot of discussion on the COVID-19. And uh, after that, it's almost uh, five months. So things 
are changing, you know, quickly. But still, you know, I think well, for our part, you know, uh, the uh, uh, valuable experience I'd like to share with you, I think basically remain the same. You know, uh, first, I think it's a system, you know, of the country, you know, uh, because under the uh, strong leadership of President Xi Jinping, we are actually uh, leveraging the unique advantages of the system. And uh, we have taken the decisive measures to make sure that the most comprehensive and rigorous and uh, thorough measures you know, have been uh, taken you know, to address the COVID-19. You know. So that's a uh, you know, very important part of our job, because as you can imagine, for Wuhan, you know, the city uh, which first reported the case, we took decisive measures to have the city locked down on January 23rd. And that was just one day before our spring festival, the most important traditional festival in China. So that needs a lot of courage to do that. But we did that and uh, we managed, you know, the uh, spread of the virus. And also at that time, you could uh, imagine, even as we were talking about back five months ago, you know, Wuhan and uh, Hubei province still a lot cases, you know, happened at that time. Uh, what we are, uh, were doing at that time is actually to mobilize, you know, our uh, health experts from around the country. So altogether, more than 42,000 health experts, you know, had been uh, sent to uh, the city of Wuhan and uh, Hubei province. And uh, that also been uh, very effective in containing the virus in the city of Wuhan and the uh, Hubei province. And secondly, I'd like to uh, uh, also draw your attention uh, to society. So another S, you know, starting the, with S, the better society, because it's not only uh, on the uh, government level, you know, on the uh, government on the government level for other countries, but also for societies, for communities. I think the people are all involved in this what we call the people's war against COVID-19. So everybody, you know, is uh, becoming a, a member of the uh, team to fight the COVID-19. But of course, for the ordinary people, their task is to make sure that they follow the instructions from the government. So like what we are doing here in Canada, stay at home, you know, that's very important, especially at the early stage of the uh, disease. And the wearing masks, and uh, that has proven in a very effective way to cut off the spread of the virus. And thirdly, I would also like to point out to the word science. I think from the very beginning, we have been approaching the outbreak, you know, uh, from the science-based uh, manner. You know. So that's why you know we have summarized, uh, I think, a whole range of. Uh, 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 arrangements, you know, to deal with the uh, disease. Uh, we call it early reporting, uh, early isol uh, quarantine, you know, early treatment, you know. That's very important to make sure that not only those patients, but all those close contacts could have been uh, traced and uh, identified and they receive early treatment as soon as possible. And uh, that's also uh, 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 go a long way to help be uh, containing the virus. And also in the process, we have developed antiviral drugs, you know, and we are using the medicine plus the traditional Chinese medicine. So there's uh, some combination of the uh, therapy in place. And uh, we are also working on the uh, vaccine. Of course, there's still a long way to go, but we are working on that. And lastly, I would also to mention the term of uh, strengthening cooperation with the international community. And that's also very important because for this particular virus, it knows no borders and it poses great threat, not only to China, but to all the countries uh, in the international community. So that's why from the very beginning, we have making sure that we are quite open and transparent and uh, highly responsible when it comes to sharing the information and uh, all the valuable experience uh, with other countries and the regions, especially with WHO. So uh, actually, uh, even uh, as early as the 3rd of January this year, you know, we had this information being shared with WHO. And on uh, January 12th, 
uh, just nine days later, we had shared with the uh, sequencing of the genome, you know, with the WHO and the relevant countries and the regions. So that's helped a lot. And uh, later on, we had provided medical assistance to more than 150 countries and international organizations, including Canada. Of course, we also value very much the support and the sympathy here from Canada to the people, you know, in China. So just because of this kind of a strengthened cooperation, I think we still are, are very much confident that we can win the final battle against the virus. So that's my uh, observation. Thank you. Ambassador, no doubt that, that a lot of that cooperation, and I know, you know, we, we'll talk a bit about the, the, the joint research we're doing, Canada-China on the vaccine, the information sharing, but that probably has played a role. I, I, no doubt you've noticed the statistics in Canada that the new incidence of COVID, the, the deaths per, uh, per million, they're, they're going down dramatically. In fact, in July, I think we've been averaging 14 to 15 a day. Uh, ha have, have you advice you can share with us in terms of, again, you've seen the statistics going down. Are there additional measures you feel Canada should or could be doing to bring it down even further? You know, I'm happy to see actually uh, here, you know, uh, with the strong efforts being taken at the federal level and also throughout the provinces in Canada, you know, you are making progress in containing the virus. So uh, a lot of provinces and the regions have uh, reopened and uh, yeah. starting from today, you know, most of uh, the province of Ontario will be entering the phase three you know, for re reopening. So that's right. all in news. And uh, still, I would like to share with the people here, uh, I think my suggestion is that we should be uh, uh, not slacken our guard against the virus because it's very dangerous and it could come back at any time. So even, uh, uh, you can imagine, even we have taken the most comprehensive and the rigorous measures, still, you know, we had some of the uh, uh, new confirmed cases in China. Right. Although it's only in a single digit or just uh, uh, around 10 cases. Uh, so what we are doing is first to make sure that uh, we prevent the cases from the uh, abroad. You know, and yeah. That's uh, very important. And the secondly, to make sure that there will be uh, no resurgence domestically. So that's the information and the experience I would like to share with the people here. Thank you for that. Now, now as we move forward, there really is a lot about lessons learning, how we're going to come out of this. Uh, Many countries have been pushing for the international review, COVID-19. You saw World Health Organization started a review last week. How do you see an international review helping? Uh, what's China's position on it? What's your position on it? I don't know, for identifying the uh, origin of the uh, virus, of course, is of great importance. And uh, at the same time, I believe not only China, but a lot of other countries and including the uh, institutions like WHO, we all agree that for doing this kind of thing, it's actually a very complex and uh, scientific uh, question, you know. So that's why, you know, we are making sure that we are supporting the uh, WHO led efforts in this regard. So we actually co-sponsored the resolution, you know, uh, WHA resolution together with Canada and a lot of other countries in making sure there will be a, going to be a, a study review, inclusive review in this regard. And that's not only targeted against China, but because the, as I mentioned, China was the first one to report the case, but it does not mean that China should be the origin of the virus because there could be a lot of other places and it has been proven you know, recently. So I think uh, what we are doing now is to working with WHO and recently two experts from WHO, you know, under the uh, arrangement uh, between China and the WHO, they have arrived in Beijing and uh, to talk, uh, discuss on the issue together with our uh, medical uh, and health experts. And I think as WHO had uh, pledged, they will also uh, conduct the similar kinds of uh, uh, investigation into other countries, a lot more countries. And I think uh, in that process, maybe uh, uh, eventually we can identify the source, but it's a very complex issue and should be 
based on science and not based on uh, political manipulation. Because as some country, especially the United States, uh, it has argued you know, for this kind of uh, politicization of the virus. Uh, certainly, that's a very, uh, very dangerous thing. And I suggest that for the United States, it should address its own problem properly before it can talk about anything in a fair and objective way. Ambassador, that's a very interesting comment that you make in terms of the, the origination source. So let me throw out to you, I, and I agree with you, let's, let's not, quote, lay blame, let's not assign a region. But the one thing that's coming out of this is uh, many companies going, the concept of the global value chain is dangerous, whether it's China, whether it's the United States, whether it's Europe, wherever it came from, if value chains get shut down, they're looking at regionalization, localization. How is this growing debate on global value chains being handled in China? What steps are you taking in China to alleviate concerns about global value chains going forward? And that's certainly got to be an international trade issue. It's got to be a, a major economic issue, especially with China. You know, I think for uh, uh, this question actually relates to uh, globalization. And indeed, some forces and uh, even some countries, some governments are taking the advantage of the outbreak to try to stop uh, the uh, globalization. Uh, I don't think it's a right choice because for globalization, it's uh, in keeping with the trend of the times. Uh, it's, you know, it's moving forward. Now it's uh, like the ocean, you know, for the uh, economy of all the countries. It's an uh, ocean and uh, it's a uh, rivers of each country running into the ocean. And it's uh, very difficult. And you cannot do that. Say today, you can try to uh, move the water back, you know, from the ocean to different isolated lakes or rivers. But for the United States, it's now taking the advantage and trying to uh, uh, clamor for decoupling. And that's very dangerous. But for us, we are making sure, even as President Xi, when he was attending the G20 uh, virtual leadership meeting back in March, he had emphasized a lot on maintaining the uh, supply chain and the production chain you know, globally. And uh, we are doing that. You know, we are not uh, closing our door to the outside. You know, actually, we are encouraging more and more uh, imports from the other countries. So as you can see, for the second quarter of this year, we had uh, actually had a positive growth rate of 3.2%. And also, the uh, whether it's imports and exports have been up. So that's providing a driving force for the uh, global market and inject confidence into the uh, globalization. So we are doing what we can to make sure that we will continue to be uh, one of the engines for the world and the trade uh, growth. That's important. So that there, there's a so there's a growing emphasis then in China on the trade agenda to instill confidence that the Chinese part of the supply chain is still pretty intact and can deal with global demand. Is that where this is going? Yeah, I think of course in the first quarter of the year, uh, you would notice that there was a decrease, you know, in those figures, both export and import. But starting from the second quarter. You know, you will see that actually the number have been uh, on the uh, uh, increase, and that's good. And now China is the only major economy in the world which has achieved a positive growth rate. And hopefully for 2020, whether it's a uh, uh, IMF and the World Bank, they also uh, have the forecast that China will be uh, in the range of the uh, positive growth rate. So, so that's that, that helps us understand a bit more on the trade agenda, and I thank you for sharing that. We'll talk more about that if there's time. On the international relations agenda, can you help the viewers, can you help Canadians understand a little bit more about the the aggressive type approach being taken with the two Michaels, and, and how do we move forward on that? And again, you, you, were, you, you shared some very good insights when we met last time. Uh, it's about the bilateral uh, relationship, and I think for the cases related to the uh, two Canadian citizens, you know, the nature has been very clear. Uh, there is no arbitrary, arbitrary uh, detention. There is no aggressive 
conduct when it comes to those two Canadian citizens. Actually, uh, it's uh, our competent uh, organs you know, have been dealing with the cases independently and strictly according to law, because those Canadian citizens have been involved in the activities uh, endangering, our, endangering our national security. So that's why they have been uh, formally prosecuted last month. And the fact is clear and the evidence is uh, clear and uh, solid. But uh, at the same time, we are making sure that their legitimate rights you know, are protected. So you could see that even against the backdrop of the COVID-19, they had received uh, good treatment, especially in sometimes a special treatment. So to make sure that uh, they can uh, cope with the uh, COVID-19 and not be infected. So they are in the sound state. And at the same time, I'd like to argue that the main obstacle for the relationship between China and Canada is still the Momento incident, which you know we have been arguing from the very beginning. It's a, a serious political uh, incident in nature, and we do hope that the Canadian side will make the right decision and to release her as soon as possible. Yeah, and that's a very good example of, of, of the international relations side of the discussion. Are you at the same time, is your counterpart in the United States similarly engaging in dialogue and uh, challenging the U.S. government in terms of the, you know, the Madame Meng issue in Canada as well? Because that's, that's their extradition request. So can you share with us a little bit more about the U.S. part of China's approach on this? So the United States, you know, it was the one who plotted the case and the purpose is trying to bring down Huawei and other high-tech enterprises of China. So uh, I think even here in Canada, an uh, increasing number of people with, in with insight have seen through the nature of that clearly. And that's why you, know, you could see that uh, you know, for the past few weeks, a lot more people are calling for the Canadian government to be aware of the nature and uh, suggesting that actually the uh, extradition request from the US side has put Canada into a very difficult place. And they asked the Canadian government to uh, make a decision you know, to stop the uh, extradition process. But for the United States, I haven't seen anything that uh, they are going to do with the, uh, this kind of the issue. Actually, recently, they are stepping up the pressure on Huawei and other high-tech industries of China. You know, And uh, even uh, they are doing a lot of things, try to smear China and uh, uh, to attack China. So that's, uh, you know, what we firmly opposed to. And uh, it's not, you know, in I, I get that. That's, that's the trade. I'm just asking you, uh, uh, Ambassador Tsu, to share with us the activities that China is doing to encourage the United States to drop that extradition request. So we know what, what's happening in Canada. That's well documented. We're not as clear in terms of, and that's why I said this is the broader international relations, international trade strategy. Are there similar requests being made by your counterpart in Washington? Um, uh, is there action being taken by China to get the United States to drop the requesters? Or is the activity just directed against Canada? And, and again, not a, uh, a value statement. We're just trying to understand the overall strategy. You know that for this issue, we are not only uh, talking to Canada, but also we are urging the United States to stop this kind of, uh, you know, uh, erroneous uh, practice, uh, to uh, stop the uh, extradition uh, treat, uh, request. So that's from the very be beginning, because anyway, it's the United States who plotted the incident. So uh, our position has been clear and consistent from the very beginning. So let, let's let's continue, not on, on the Michaels, but again, that's part of our relations. Uh, you and I talked about it, 50 year anniversary of our relations, many academic exchanges, scientific. It's a long history of good relationships between the country. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning about the joint Canada-China research on COVID vaccine. Do you have any update in terms of where that's out from a, at from a regulatory perspective in terms of moving that one forward? You know that for our bilateral relationship, you know, in a general term, of course, you mentioned it's uh, been uh, 50 years, you know, since we uh, established diplomatic ties. And when we looking back, you know, I think there are a lot of things we can draw from this uh, 
the, the, the development of our relationship. And I think three uh, key words you know, we have to have kept in mind. First is uh, common interests. And uh, indeed, you know, for China and Canada, although we are countries with different systems, with different uh, cultures, with different historical backgrounds, but still we have a lot of common interests, not only for trade and investment. Of course, we have achieved that a lot in the past 50 years. Our trade volume has been uh, as much as 500 times in the 2019, if you compare that back in the 1970s. So that has de delivered tangible uh, benefits for our two peoples, but also in terms of people-to-people -people exchange, like education cooperation. And we have about 230,000 students here in Canada, studying in Canada. And when I talk to those uh, leadership with the uh, universities and the colleges here in the, uh, Canada, you know, the U15, you know, the, the most prestigious in the 15 universities, I talk to most of them, and they do welcome more and more Chinese students to come this way. Of course, we also would like to see more Canadian students to visit China. And also, I think, not only bilaterally, but also on the multilateral front, China and Canada, we have a lot of things in common. We are in support of uh, uh, multilateralism, international system, international order, and we oppose unilateralism and the protectionist. So there's a lot of things we can do, whether it's coping with climate change, uh, sustainable development, or fighting this kind of uh, you know, disease, you know, this uh, newly emerging disease or other kinds of uh, you know, diseases. So that means a lot for China and Canada. And the second key word is uh, cooperation. I think our relationship should be defined by uh, cooperation because that's very important. And only by doing so, uh, cooperation on the basis of uh, mutual respect and uh, equality can we maintain the momentum for our bilateral relationship. And also, I think at the same time, the third key word is uh, confrontation. We should avoid confrontation. Although we have differences, but we should agree uh, to disagree. No, no. That's only natural for two important countries like China and Canada. So we have to uh, admit there are differences and uh, we should talk quietly, you know, having this kind of uh, uh, internal communication rather than being engaged in the microphone diplomacy. So that's my observation for the relationship. Thank you. And so that's really the how you see us moving forward in terms of going back to our traditional good relations with, with, with China. And that really leads me, because I, I know Andrew has questions he wants to pose. I'm going to ask you what's called a clearinghouse big question at the end that will help us once again understand not just the Canadian side uh, for China-Can relations, but globally. And, and for that, I'm, I'm kind of going to try to summarize uh, our discussion in a way. And, and like any good professor, it means I'm going to have to turn back to my uh, I call it my whiteboard, even though I'm, I am definitely in my basement, uh, just so people will know I'm not in the university. I'm going to go to the uh, my whiteboard and, and try to summarize this. And you made some very good points. So you start off, and excuse me as I, I stand up here and I, I join in. Now let's see if I, no, I didn't get that moving over. I apologize. I didn't get my, uh, my whiteboard. I'll give it one more try. And if it doesn't work, I'm just going to have to talk it through. go yeah I put the wrong one in okay there we are okay so in our discussion today you've brought up very appropriately so on the international trade side you know Huawei and Huawei and you know you're absolutely right we saw the UK uh, take action this week uh, Canada is waiting to make an announcement you know, we can talk at great length about Huawei, that's trade. We've talked a bit about the global value chain and I do like the fact that you mentioned steps China's taken to ensure security in the global value chain. Again, that's part of that international trade agenda. So there's been several items we've mentioned that are clearly in the domain of ensuring that international trade, China and the rest of the world, and again, this is not about Canada, let's take this globally, goes through. At the same time, on the international relations side, and remember, I'm an international business prof. And I've been going to China for 25 years. It's a country I admire greatly. 
I admire China for the long-term view that they take for the strategic approach. It's very impressive and I, I, more governments could learn from a long-term foresight view as opposed to short-term. But in the international relations, while there's this trade, I've noticed that you know when it comes to the UK, you mentioned we shouldn't confront uh, you know the megaphone. There's definitely coming from China some negativity towards the UK. It's loud. Australia, uh, United States, uh, recently sanctions put on Cruz and others. We could bring in Canada. Obviously, uh, you, you, there's been an announcement made out of by yourself and out of China about Canada. We could bring in Southeast Asia. There's several countries that at this point on the international relations side, we see at a strategic level, some very strong language. And again, you have the right to your international relations, you have your right to your international trade. Help us understand at an overarching level what the strategy is for relations and trade, how it's being set, and in a sense, what China is hoping for as the end game with this approach. So that's the broad question. Yeah. Indeed, you know, uh, you mentioned the international trade and the international relations, political you know, landscape. And for us, I think our aim remains the same when it comes to the uh, foreign policy aspect of the government. It's to make sure that we uh, adhere to the path of peaceful development. And our uh, mission is trying to make sure that we continue to contribute to first peace and stability in the world, you know, whether it's in Asia or elsewhere. And secondly, we are going to serve as the engine for global trade and economy. And of course, these two factors are intertwined. You know, it cannot simply just separate them, you know, because without a peaceful environment, you cannot achieve economic and the trade growth. So that's why for us, we are trying to make sure that we continue to be a force uh, here to for peace and uh, development, you know. So that's our mission of our foreign policy, you know, as a whole. Of course, that's a very broad answer to your very broad question. So then in, in that light, where do, does this side here, and I just put up a few of the countries, and again, we're not talking about each of the individuals, just the broad strategy. How does that fit in terms of that philosophy? And where do you see it going to as we move forward in the next year, two years? Yeah, I think that uh, for uh, China, for our policy, it's gaining a lot more support here, uh, you know, globally. You mentioned the United States, Australia, UK, you know, five I maybe, you know, uh, but I think for those uh, Western countries cannot rep represent the whole of the international community. For us, I think our policy, you know, have been widely acknowledged throughout, you know, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere. I have just uh, an example in the recent Human Rights Council, which was you know, in Geneva. And uh, in that uh, particular session, more than 70 countries had spoken uh, uh, in favor of our policy towards Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Well, only a handful, I think roughly 20 Western countries had voices, uh, so-called concern. So we could see very clearly, you know, uh, what on our side is the vast majority of the member of the international community. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you for sharing that with us. That, that Again, like when we got together personally, you have some interesting insights that help place some of this into a good context. You shared with us insights on COVID as well, international relations. Andrew, I, I, I wish I had another hour or two with, uh, with the ambassador. I, I really do enjoy our time together and I, I hope we can actually physically get together soon. But on, on that note, Andrew, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you for uh, the questions. Thank Andrew, you. Thank you, uh, Jonathan Kaloff. We have a number of questions, uh, Ambassador, and what I'll do is just go through them fairly quickly. So I'll do short questions, uh, short answers, and we'll get through as many as we can. Right. Um, so the first is with regards to Hong Kong. Um, is the era is the era of one nation, two systems over? 
definitely not, because it's a misunderstanding of the new law in Hong Kong. Actually, it would mean a more steady development and the implementation of one country, two systems, because it's our basic uh, national policy to have the one country, two systems. What happened uh, last June, uh, since June last year, you know, was uh, just a small number of people trying to disrupt the uh, law and order in Hong Kong, and uh, that caused a lot of disruption to the implementation of one country, two systems. And uh, also that had scared away a lot of investors. So what we are going to do with this new law is to protect the vast majority of those law-abiding residents in Hong Kong including those foreign personnel and the companies in Hong Kong. So there's nothing like one country, two systems is that. On the country, it's uh, uh, providing a strong legal institution and a guarantee for the one country, two systems and uh, the uh, high degree of autonomy in Hong Kong. Okay, and, and the second question relates in, in part to that last part of what you just said. Um, for the 300,000 Canadian citizens in Hong Kong, are there uh, human rights uh, to be respected? Not really, you know, because I think vast majority of those people, they are law abiding people, you know. And for those law, this new law is only targeted at a very small number of people who are engaged in the four categories of crimes, you know. Uh, that's very dangerous, you know, crimes like subversion, you know, like you know, secession, like the uh, terrorist activities, like colluding with, you know, foreign countries, try to uh, overthrow the regime in Hong Kong. So I think for those Canadian people, for those enterprises and all the other members uh, of the international community, they should come to realize that this law, when it comes into effect, will help provide the legitimate rights and the interests of those foreigners. And actually, I think, uh, for the stand and the poor, you know, the, uh, the the important agency, they has make sure that they believe the law itself, you know, maintains the stability uh, for the economy, uh, you know, in Hong Kong, and uh, it keeps it maintains its rating of Hong Kong. You know. So that's, a, I think, a very good example to explain that. Okay, uh, the next question has to do with the Belt and Road Initiative. Do you see a role for Canada? in building that, is there a role across uh, Europe and Asia uh, where Canada could be part of that initiative? For a Belt and Road Initiative, you know, it's not a political agenda. It's rather for economic cooperation. So it's for the uh, uh, extensive, you know, co consultation and uh, for the uh, mutual benefits and the mutual construction. So I indeed hope that there will be opportunities for the uh, Canadian companies because uh, they have the uh, unique advantage in programs like sustainable development, like agriculture, like infrastructure, like clean energy, uh, and even Arctic, you know. Uh, are those, you know, those are the, uh, uh, I think, the points that under consideration for future cooperation among those uh, countries along the Belt and the Road. So I do believe Canada, uh, the companies, they can take full advantage of the Belt and Road Initiative and to take part in that. Okay, and this, the next question is in regards to uh, Michael Kovrig, Michael Spavor, and, uh, and Madam Meng. Uh, can detainees in China and Canada be treated similarly so that they would all be under house arrest, uh, as is the case with Madam Meng? You know, for those two Canadian citizens, uh, as I uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, they had been detained because they are you know, involved in the activities endangering our national security. However, their lawful rights you know, have been guaranteed and we have made special arrangement for them. Like, you know, Mr. Kavri had a telephone conversation with you at the time. So all those, you know, have received, you know, uh, appreciation from the families you know, of the citizens involved. But for Madame Meng, you know, the case, the nature of that is uh, absolutely different from those two Canadian citizens. So she's not supposed to be detained in the first place because she's breaking no laws here in Canada. So I think that's why you know, a lot more people are asking 
for the government to make the right decision. And those, that's also our uh, hope, you know, and we urge the government here, you know, to uh, proceeding from the merits of the things itself and also from the, uh, uh, the humanitarian uh, reason to uh, release Madame Meng uh, sooner rather than later and to make sure a safe return to China. Okay, and uh, with regards to uh, uh, Chinese students uh, studying in Canada, there had been a, an advisory to students about uh, their safety in Canada. What's your position? Do you still encourage uh, Canadian uh, Chinese students to be coming to Canada? You know that uh, actually what happened here is, uh, uh, I think, especially during COVID-19, uh, there are those uh, vicious remarks and even actions, you know, in the streets. So from a report in uh, Vancouver, you know, uh, these kind of actions are on spike, you know, a lot, you know, than the previous years. So that's why we would like to draw uh, our students' attention to that. But basically, I think we still, you know, uh, are making sure that the students here, you know, they are uh, living peacefully, you know, in a very good environment. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the universities and the colleges for taking good care of our students in Canada to provide them with adequate facilities, even during this difficult time. And, and during the difficult time with COVID, do you see um, students continue to come here or will they, do you think they prefer to stay home and um, participate on yeah, through online means with their with their um, professors and, and universities. Because of the uh, special arrangement for the COVID-19, as I have learned, even for the fourth semester, a lot of universities actually opt for the online courses. Uh, even uh, maybe it's a prediction the uh, situation will be stabilizing for the uh, COVID-19, but still they would like to prefer these online courses. So that's why some of the students, uh, they would rather to take the online courses back in China. But still, uh, currently, I suggest a uh, lot of students still remain here in Canada. So that's also a very good news. And also a lot uh, newly enrolled students. You know, but I'm not so sure about the visa policy at that time, because currently, uh, because of the uh, restriction you know, for those foreigners coming this way, uh, the students haven't been granted visas yet. Uh, and uh, uh, just to wait and see what's happening uh, for the next few weeks. Yeah. Okay. Well, th thank you for that. We've we've run our, our time. I, I just want to remind our our audience that we've got uh, more webinars coming up in the next few weeks. On uh, July the 23rd, we have a session with Ambassador Bob Ray, the new Canadian ambassador to the United Nations. On July the 27th, we have on 29th rather, we have webinar with the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney, who will be talking about his agenda for Strong Canada. And on August the 11th, we have a webinar with Marco Mendicino, who is the Minister of Immigration. Uh, so with that, I, I, I want to take uh, the um, opportunity to thank you, Ambassador. Um, out of all the discussions, I, I, I will leave you with one thing. At part of our, 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 our purpose is to try and understand each other better and to see where we can find better relations between our countries. Um, there is, uh, as, as we talked uh, earlier, as Professor uh, Kaloff mentioned, this is the 50th year of Canada-China relations uh, when uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau opened relations with uh, Chairman Mao 50 years ago. Um, and it's been an interesting uh, run. And indeed, Canada was the first uh, Western nation to begin relations. Um, and we're obviously uh, proud of that because, because uh, China is, is one of the great civilizations of the world. Uh, Canada is a much newer civilization, so it, it's important to have good relations. If, as we look for for good relations, the one thing I would I would leave with you is, if the two Michaels can have the same kind of living conditions as Madame Mung, I would see a great thaw and a great improvement in our relations. I know we're in a new world order, but I would just leave that with you and hope that you and your government would give that some consideration. Uh, that we find whatever ways we can to get back to where we were uh, prior to a number of differences over the past uh, few years. Um, but we have a new world order. China's part of the new, a new world order taking place. Uh, Canada's part of that. And we look forward to building uh, better relations. Thank you for your time.
And uh, we look forward to hosting you again, uh, maybe in five months or less. Thank, so thank you, you guys. so much, Mr. And also, uh, I'd like to extend thanks to your team, you know, to your colleagues. And thank you once again, for Professor, for moderating you know, this event. So my message, once again, is that we will do everything possible you know, to ensure the legitimate rights of the Canadian citizens. And, uh, and for the bilateral relationship in a general term, I believe still uh, uh, there's a, a bright prospect because we believe we are living in a shrinking globe. Uh, you know, yeah. the main thing is a, a community with a shared future. That's our vision, you know. So China and Canada, as you point out, are both important members of this global community. And we can do a lot of things together. It's, uh, you know, for us to make sure that we will make, you know, this world more safe, you know, and uh, more environmentally friendly and the more sustainable for development. That's our common vision, I think, for this uh, human mankind in the years to come. And there's a lot we can do together. Yeah, thank you very much. My phone is keep pinging because there are more and more uh, questions for you. But I want to thank you for your time today and thank our audience for joining us. Please do join us again over the next few weeks with, uh, with uh, further webinars. Thank, thank you, you everybody. for all joining this event. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.